They say history is unforgiving, historical mistakes cannot be undone and they have a cascading effect on a nation's future. The story of independent India is littered with such instances, costly blunders. The Kashmir saga is one such. Hello and welcome to Gravitas Plus, I'm Palki Sharma Upadhyay. On the 5th of August, India marked two years since the abrogation of Article 370, a historic decision that revoked the special status of Jammu and Kashmir, bifurcated it into two union territories and put Kashmir at par with the rest of India. The decision also opened the floodgates of righteous rage, of misinformation campaigns on how the move was unconstitutional, of accusations on how India is crushing independence in Kashmir. This is mostly because a vast majority still don't know how Jammu and Kashmir got this special status in the first place. It is important to look at the historical background to understand the full significance of this decision. Our story begins in 1947, the year India was partitioned. There were a total of 562 princely states, each of them ruled independently by a king or a nawab. The British controlled these states but did not interfere with their internal affairs. When they left, a potent question arose, what would be the status of the princely states? The Indian Independence Act of 1947 clearly stipulated that these states could either join India through the instrument of accession, merge with Pakistan or remain independent. Most of them joined India, some chose Pakistan. Maharaja Hari Singh, the king of Jammu and Kashmir, wished to keep his state independent, mostly because he had differences with India and its Prime Minister Jawaharlal Nehru. What differences? Nehru had a friend in Kashmir, Sheikh Abdullah, the leader of Kashmir's first political party, the Kashmir Muslim Conference, which is known today as the National Conference. Sheikh Abdullah also wanted to rule Kashmir. He reportedly wanted a communist form of government. So in 1946, Abdullah launched an agitation against the king, the Quit Kashmir Movement a copy of the Quit India movement. Not only was this agitation driven purely by personal ambition, it was illogical as it was directed against an Indian and not a foreign occupying force. Sheikh Abdullah wanted the king to leave the valley. How did Nehru see all of this? Well, he was a Kashmiri Pandit himself and he is said to have ignored Sheikh Abdullah's moves. Nehru called Abdullah his blood brother, a man above suspicion who could do no wrong and was only acting in the interest of Kashmir, a state governed by a Hindu king with a predominantly Muslim population. This bias was evident in an August 1945 statement, a statement that Nehru made at the annual session of the National Conference in Sopor. He is claimed to have said, if non-Muslims want to live in Kashmir, they should join the national conference or bid goodbye to the country. If pundits do not join it, no safeguards or weightages will protect them. Such events and statements led to distrust. Maharaja Hari Singh ordered the arrest of Sheikh Abdullah in May 1946. And Nehru saw this as an insult. The divide between him and the Maharaja widened and had a bearing on Kashmir's future. When the British decided to leave India, Hari Singh faced a dilemma. Should he remain independent or join Pakistan or India? This decision was as much personal as it was political. If he acceded to India, an adverse response from Pakistan was imminent. If he acceded to Pakistan, he would be resented by the Hindus of Jammu and Kashmir, also by Sheikh Abdullah, who had his own plans. Maharaja Hari Singh was caught between a rock and a hard place and that's when he received a letter. A letter from Sheikh Abdullah. Casting aside his pride, Abdullah made an appeal to join the Indian Union. The change in Abdullah's tone was mainly due to personal reasons. Had the Maharaja chosen Pakistan, Abdullah's own political future would have been in peril. Because Pakistan's leader, Muhammad Ali Jinnah, considered Sheikh Abdullah a quote-unquote quizzling, a traitor, an agent of the Congress party who was trying to barter Kashmir to India for the sake of his personal profit and power. This hatred was evident in a remark made by Jinnah where he called Abdullah a tall man who sings the Quran and exploits the people. So seeing the danger Pakistan posed to his plans, Abdullah expressed his willingness to work with Maharaja Hari Singh even if temporarily. And this led to Kashmir's accession to India on October 26, 1947. This was barely four days after Pakistani tribesmen led by the Pakistan army invaded Kashmir and swiftly reached near Srinagar. The capital's fate was hanging by a thread. The king signed the instrument of accession. The Indian army intervened. It liberated occupied territories and made Kashmir an integral part of India. But Pakistan's provocations did not stop. 
Its raiders remain stationed at the border, waiting for an opportunity to strike. Some accounts say their operations were being orchestrated by General Mesavi, a British general and the first commander-in-chief of the Pakistan army. These actions were in complete violation of Britain's decision to not interfere between the two sides. Well, they did so nonetheless, not just militarily, but also diplomatically. On the Indian side, there was another Englishman serving the interests of his country, Lord Mountbatten, the last Viceroy of India, now the Governor-General. He travelled to Lahore in November 1947. He held talks with Muhammad Ali Jinnah. In Mountbatten's own words, he was unbriefed and unauthorised by the Government of India. Lord Mountbatten made a proposal to Jinnah to hold a plebiscite in Kashmir, a proposal he is said to have drafted on his flight from New Delhi to Lahore. And a proposal which Mountbatten said, and I'm quoting, I had not yet shown to my government, but to which I thought they might agree. In other words, Mountbatten assumed that India would agree to a plebiscite. But the fact is that even Pakistan was not in its favour. Jinnah is said to have objected strongly to a plebiscite, calling it redundant and undesirable. So why did Mountbatten make such an offer? Apparently to appease Jinnah. How did India respond to this unauthorised offer? India played along. It was the biggest mistake in Kashmir. The Prime Minister of India held a broadcast. He agreed to a UN-controlled plebiscite in Kashmir, hoping that this was the only way to stop the war. And this time, Pakistan too jumped at the proposal, hoping that the Muslim-dominated region would vote in its favour. But this decision sucked both countries, especially India, into the vortex of international politics. It turned Kashmir into an unsolvable problem, a pawn in the hands of world powers. India, the complainant in the case, was treated the same way as Pakistan, the aggressor. The merits of India's case got lost in power politics, despite the fact that Kashmir's accession to India was lawful and that Pakistan was no match to India's military prowess in the ongoing war. Simply put, India shot itself in the foot by going to the United Nations. Jawaharlal Nehru is said to have admitted that this was a mistake. He said, and I quote, The Kashmir issue has given us a great deal of trouble. The attitude of great powers has been astonishing. Some of them have shown active partisanship for Pakistan. We have not been given a square deal. He was right. India did not get a square deal. And as trouble brewed internationally, at home petty politics followed. Sheikh Abdullah was released from prison. He was made the Prime Minister of Kashmir, the head of an emergency administration. But as soon as Sheikh Abdullah assumed power, he took a somersault. He broke his promises made to India. He began advocating for Kashmir's independence. By 1953, Abdullah had become so uncompromising and overbearing that he even turned against Prime Minister Nehru, his so-called blood brother. Sheikh Abdullah challenged Nehru's authority and is said to have conspired to make himself sultan e kashmir the ruler of an independent Kashmir. His calls for independence resonated with the people of the valley, who became completely oblivious of the fact that Kashmir had legally acceded to India. Anticipating another conflict, New Delhi began accommodating Abdullah's whims. And in return, Abdullah tried to bargain and blackmail. He struck deals with the Indian establishment, which only ensured that Kashmir's integration with India remained incomplete. Article 370 and Section 35A of the Indian Constitution are a classic example of such bargains. They were adopted in the Indian Constitution, and they gave Kashmir the power to have a separate constitution, a state flag, and autonomy over its internal affairs. These are powers with other states did not enjoy. Kashmir was the only exception. But this clearly wasn't enough. Sheikh Abdullah showed no regard for India's gestures. He kept on pushing for Kashmir's independence. In an interview to the Scotsman, Abdullah said, accession to either side cannot bring peace and independent Kashmir must be guaranteed. This was the story of the genesis of the Kashmir dispute, a dispute that has seen it all. Betrayal, conspiracies, armed skirmishes, war, separatism, terror. Let me also say this, this is a dispute of India's own making, a dispute with countless mistakes, letting foreign powers meddle in its affairs and letting friendships influence political decisions, being the biggest mistakes of them all. Gravitas Plus, co-presented by Skoda, made of smart imagination.